podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. So, uh, we'll talk about works that appeared last month in collaboration with uh, Josef Bena, Marina Gran, and Stanislav Kuperstein, and some work uh, that uh, will appear soon, and some previous work also in collaboration with Gregory Gic and Anni Calmagi in Sacre. So, we compute the back reaction of uh, smeared anti D3 brains on the Clement Strassler geometry. So, we smear the anti D3 brains uh, on the three sphere at the tip of the deformed conifer. And the motivation to study the back reaction is that uh, many phenomenological models are based on uh, anti D3 Susie breaking in uh, warped throat. For example, the <coughs> KKLT model, uh, the, the this construction of the Sitter vacua, and many models on inflation. And the non compact setup that I will consider is also interesting to study SUSY breaking in holography. So we first find a linearized solution. So we add P anti D3 brains and we, we, we treat them as a first order perturbation of the Clemano Strassler geometry in an expansion in the parameter P over M, where uh, M are the units of the Ramon Ramon three form flux over the S3 of the conifer. And from the probe analysis of Kacho, Pearson, and Verlinde, we expect that when this parameter is small, uh, there should exist a metastable NS5 brain state in this setup. So we found a solution that is valid for the whole throat, so it connects the IR and the UV region. And so we were able to explicitly compute the quantization of uh, all the uh, ultraviolet parameters. However, uh, we find that this solution has an integrable uh, infrared singularity uh, proportional to the number of antebrains in the energy densities of the uh, three form fluxes. And this is not directly sourced from the anti D3 brains, so uh, it, the in interpretation is, uh, is non clear. However, we are in a region, in the near brain region, in which the linearized approximation clearly breaks down. And it has been suggested that this singularity could be an artifact of perturbation theory. But so uh, now we performed a, a full nonlinear analysis in the near brain region and we proved the following. So we assume that there is no flux singularity, so the solution is regular, and we pass the following anti D3 boundary conditions. Note that the world factor uh, singularity comes from this mirrored anti D3 source. And we search for a solution which has the same UV asymptotic as the Clebon Strasser solution. And we expect something which, is, which has some uh, amount of negative charge in the infrared region and which is glued to some uh, positive charge in UV. And we prove that such a solution does not exist. Actually, we, we prove that the only regular solution uh, compatible with this boundary condition is the anti clebon strassel solution, uh, which has negative charge all the way up to the UV and it doesn't break supersymmetry. Uh, so it's clear that uh, the, uh, any anti D3 solution, uh, so we should drop the assumption that the, there is no flux singularity and those, the, this flux singularity, has, uh, 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 they are not an artifact of perturbation theory. And so the conclusion is that the smeared, the fully back reacted anti D3 solution is singular in the infrared. However, uh, we should ask if the singularity can be uh, due to a wrong identification of infrared degrees of freedom, after all, we expect that they should polarize into an NS5 brain. Unfortunately, uh, the smearing canceled this uh, uh, NS5 channel, but in a fully back reacted background, we expect that there should exist also a, a, another channel in which the anti D3 brains polarize into a D5 brain, which brought, wraps the shrinking two sphere of the deformed conifold and sits at finite distance from the tip. And we expect to be able to detect this channel in the smeared solution, and indeed, our singularities have the correct legs to polarize such a brain. So we have to just do the computation and see what's going on. And we believe that there is, in our solution, there is no such a D5 brain channel. And so the polchinsky strasser mechanism doesn't seem to resolve this singularity. So <clears throat> my punchline is that this flux singularity survived up to the end of the talk. Thank you. Very good. I have time for one quick question. Very good. Let's thank the speaker again. Thanks. And next we have Dennis Weber. Take it away, Dennis. Okay. How
Ahora se sube. Okay. Let's switch to the slides. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for having me. So today I will talk about work in collaboration with Thomas Grimm and Maximilian Porechkin, as well as on work in progress with Thomas and Miriam Svetic. So the setups I'm going to consider are uh, compactifications of F theory on elliptically fibered singular Calabria fourfolds in the presence of uh, background G fluxes. And I will uh, discuss two aspects of the four dimensional effective physics of these fluxes. So, in the first, my first point, I would like to present an interesting perspective on how these fluxes um, generate four dimensional chirality in F theory. So, first of all, let me uh, mention that uh, G4 fluxes are naturally constructed not on the original singular fourfold, but on the resolved uh, fourfold x4 hat. And uh, then certain fluxes that are the wedge product of 1 1 forms on this uh, resolved geometry are known to generate 4D chirality. And here I want to argue um, that this can be seen in a three dimensional dual n equals 2 theory. So the three dimensional theory I want to consider can be obtained by compactifying F theory, by which I mean an n equals 1 gauge theory with some chiral matter and a representation R of the gauge group on an S1. And then um, we obtain an n equals 2 gauge theory in three dimensions. And on the Coulomb branch, the originally massless matter becomes massive. And then on the Coulomb branch, in addition, we have a dual formulation of the theory as a three dimensional compactification of M theory on the smooth fourfold X4. So now, uh, by comparing the two sides, we see an obvious mismatch because on the M theory side, there's no such uh, massive matter in three dimensions. In addition, on the M-theory side, there are classical Chern-Simons terms present, where the uh, Chern-Simons terms are determined by flux integrals of this form. However, on the F-theory side, such uh, Chern-Simons terms are classically absent, and they are only generated at one loop by integrating out the original, I mean, the mass of matter. And then in this loop computation, one can argue that uh, these Chern-Simons terms uh, encode uh, the four dimensional uh, chiral indices. And now, upon matching the two formulations of this uh, 3D theory, um, we can effectively compute these uh, loop chain Simons terms that are proportional to the chiralities by evaluating these flux integrals. And thereby, uh, the four dimensional chiral index uh, is uh, given by a certain flux integral of this form. So, let me just say in a few words um, that it um, that this uh, relation between uh, 4D and 3D physics allows us uh, to algorithmically compute the chiral index from uh, Chern Simons terms in F theories uh, that are realized as uh, toric examples. And um, in particular, we expect relations between 3D Chern Simons terms from the requirement of four dimensional anomaly cancellation. And it would be very nice to understand this in a purely three dimensional perspective. Okay, so in my second point, I would like to emphasize that uh, the back reaction of fluxes is essential in order to understand the full F theory effective action in four dimensions. And I would like to demonstrate this um, in a um, local model where the warp factor can be explicitly calculated. So the local geometry I want to consider is a periodic multi center tau nut space that, is, that can be viewed as a local model. Uh, for the elliptically fibered Calabria fourfold in the vicinity of a stack of K7 brains. And we have a um, periodic direction because we have identified type 2B and type 2A theory uh, by compactifying on an S1. And in addition, we have uh, the usual M theory circle that is fibered non trivially over this, um, over this um, top nut space. And now the nice thing is that the metric on this local model can explicitly be calculated and it's given by harmonic functions. Uh, it's specified fully by harmonic functions on R2 times S1 that take this particular form. And now since we know the metric, we can solve the flux induced uh, warp factor equation. And uh, indeed, the full um, um, warp factor can be analytically calculated by this form where Ni are the brain fluxes on the divisor S, um, vol S is the volume of this divisor, 
and upon performing now the M theory compactification on this warp geometry, it's indeed possible to compute certain alpha prime flux corrections to the seven brain gauge coupling function that cannot be obtained in a different way in F theory. Thank you. Uh, I'm Gang Li from CKS in Southern University. In this talk, I show how to incorporate R I factor into double free theory with a compatible manner with the sports symmetry. This talk based is following papers collaborated with Intap John and Zhang Yuan Park. Uh, especially, I focus on last two papers. Uh, let me start from fundamental barriers in sports symmetry double free theory. Uh, the fundamental fields are like this. Uh, the NSNS -NS sector, instead of the generalized metric, we uh, introduced the pair of fear binds. And type, four, type two sports metric, we introduced RS sector and uh, fermion fields. However, uh, because of the lack of time, I skipped the fermion part. Uh, double field theory enjoys the ODD global TDL transformation and double gauge transformation through the generalized re-derivative. And since we are considering double field bind, the double local Lorentz transformation is naturally arises. The first term is corresponding to this, and second one is corresponding to V bar. Uh, it, as uh, Riemannian geometry, double BM bind generates a pair of projections, and they are closely related to the generalized metric. And R I potential can be realized as the bispinorial representation of double local Lorentz group, and it satisfies the Carlet condition like this. Uh, for each of the double field theory gauge symmetry, it introduces a corresponding connection and master the semi covariant. Derivative. Here, gamma is a uh, connection for the double gauge symmetry, and phi and phi are spin connections for the double local Lorentz group. And we impose the following compatibility conditions. Then the connection can be uniquely determined uh, by additional uh, torsion free condition and projectivity conditions. We define other field strengths like this. And here, d plus is a covariant important operator, which scale is zero. And RI gauge transformation is given like that. So, uh, field strength, the gauge transformation of field strength is trivial because of the uh, deep potential of d plus. And we impose self dual relation by hand to, to be constant with the sports symmetry. And the Lagrangian for whole RI sector is given by these simple uh, single terms. Double field bind takes the most general parameterization. Here, E and E bar are two copies of field dimensional field bind, which gives the same metric. And we may choose an alternative parameterization. In mini group, consider this parameterization to relate to non geometric flux. And to relate to the ordinary property, we should impose the diagonal gauge fixing of double local Lorentz transformation, which identifying E and E bar. This gauge fixing breaks the local Lorentz, double local Lorentz transformation into a uh, diagonal subgroup. And to preserve the diagonal gauge fixing, all the transformation rule must be modified to a companion compensating local Lorentz transformation. Here, L bar is an element of this group, and SL bar is a spinorial representation of this group, this L bar. Especially if the determinant of L bar is minus one, the body fine audit rotation flips the character of the theory. It gives the mechanism for exchange type 2A to, to be spurred. Diagonal gauge fixing uh, leads the RI field to the usual democratic formulation of spurgravity, and the nilpotent operator D plus leads to the exterior derivative. On the other hand, there is another, uh, 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 another choice of the RI field representation, uh, we, that is uh, audit spinner representation of RI field done by these guys. And 
we show that this formalism is equivalent to our formalism. Okay. Uh, this is a type two post metric double field theory of the Fermi linear model, and this is uh, is done by Imperial Group in the context of generalized limit. Thank you very much. Very good. We have time for one question. No questions. Let's thank the speaker again. Very good. And next we have Peter Padalong from Munich. Take it away, Peter. Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. I will say something about non-geometric fluxes in higher dimensions, and this is based on work done in collaboration with David Andreo, Olafo, Magdalena Lafors, and Dieter Lust here in Munich. And I will motivate to start with from a four-dimensional perspective. So if you look at the flux compactifications, and you look at the gauge supergravity you get after some toroidal compactification, you usually end up with some gauge algebra where an object H and an object F appear with a certain index structure. We call the H field strength and the and geometric flux F. But if you now want to make this uh, T duality covariant, or equivalently uh, make the superpotential and T duality uh, covariant, you have to add some new objects Q and R with a new index structure. And we call them non geometric fluxes. So together they form a T duality chain where you can relate them uh, to each other by doing T dualities. So, phenomenologically, this helps uh, in some situations. For example, if you want to do moduli fixing or uh, obtain uh, de Sitter vacua. And the question that arises here is uh, is there any 10 dimensional origin of these non geometric fluxes? So let's have a look at 10 dimensions. So string theory, in a sense, probes geometry differently than point particles do. And we can see that in certain backgrounds, we call non-geometric backgrounds, where you e extend the structure group to include also ODD transformations or T-dualities, like shown here in this picture. Most of these, or some of these non-geometric backgrounds can be obtained as T-duals of geometric backgrounds, but not all of them. And nevertheless, they make some consistent string backgrounds, as has been argued, with no kind of straightforward target space interpretation. So examples are given by the torus vibrations with some non-trivial monodromies around the base circle or, for example, uh, asymmetric orbifolds. So the question that arises here is, um, are these non-geometric situations, non-geometric backgrounds, related to the non-geometric fluxes we have seen in four dimensions? And the answer we give is yes. And we, we see that by looking at a 10 dimensional supergravity restricted to the NSNS sector only. And we try to perform a field redefinition where we want to introduce a new object, namely this bivector beta with two indices up. And what we get in the end is uh, a new Lagrangian given in terms of these new variables where explicitly this beta appears. And we do so by looking at the generalized metric, an object that, that naturally. Um, embeds the, the metric in the B field. But as any metric, it can be um, parameterized by different field binds. And we take two particular choices to relate um, B and beta. And in particular, we get relations like this, which are highly nonlinear. Of course, we have to ca keep track of the total derivatives as we have some non trivial monogamies in these uh, non geometric backgrounds. So the result is that we are able to reveal non geometric fluxes after doing a long and tedious calculation with some impressive uh, cancellations along these uh, nonlinear factors. And we define, for example, Q flux as just being the natural choice acting with a partial derivative on beta, which gives you the right index structure straight away. And R flux turns out to be a, a little more complicated, but it appears as a squared uh, term like the H flux does before. So in some cases, we were even able to show that this ill-definedness coming from uh, non-geometric backgrounds can be resolved such that a dimensional reduction is possible. And if we compare the potential terms we get from these non-geometric fluxes, we find exactly the, the right thing, which uh, has been seen in four dimensions before. Furthermore, we were able to, to lift this procedure of performing a field redefinition to a double field theoretic setup where now uh, everything depends, of course, on doubled coordinates. And we, we get some extended definitions 
of Q and R, but we see that we can gain some kind of uh, geometric interpretation of these fluxes, as especially Q appears as a kind of connection term, and R still remains an ordinary tensor in the doubled space. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Very good. We have time for a question. Could you also relate a discrete torsion to such non-geometric fluxes? Discrete torsion? Yes. Um, Could you send me from all of them? I'm not, I'm not sure how to answer that. Sorry. Okay, well, maybe you guys can discuss that further uh, in the break. <laughs> Let's thank uh, Peter again. Yeah. Great. And next we have Andreas Dieser, also from Munich. Take it away, Andreas. OK, thank you for the invitation. I want to present um, work, which is done which I have done with Ralf Luminang, Dieter Lust, Eric Tauschin, and Felix Wernicke. It's about non-associative structures. So as a motivation, let's um, take bosonic swing theory with a B-field background. Um, and we were able to define in this model a current, which is a slightly modification to the free current. Um, and one can show that it's um, actually holomorphic and also anti-holomorphic for the anti-holomorphic part uh, up to linear order in the H-flux. Um, and as usual, one can, not, one can now define coordinates, um, which are, so to say, which one get, can get by integrating the currents. Um, and t-duality is realized, uh, as usual, by reflecting the right moving part. And with these coordinates, we were able to calculate correlators. For example, the basic um, three-point correlator, which is um, proportional to the R-flux if we do three t-dualities. So in every direction, a t-duality and this R flux is supposed to be the flux which one can get if we do three T dualities um, on the H flux. And there's, a, in addition, a Welsh dependent part, which is um, given by the Roger style algorithm. Um, and we were also able to define um, Tachyon vertex operators and in, in this framework. And by computing um, these, um, we were able to extract, um, so to say, the, the um, um, the um, properties of the algebra of functions on the target space. And we got out that um, there's a slightly modification to three, um, a product of three functions, which we call a three product. And um, the modification is, again, proportional to the R flux. So let me, um, let, uh, let me interpret this result in Poisson geometry. So let's go to Poisson geometry, um, where we have usually a Poisson tensor, um, which um, satisfies the relation that the Schalten bracket of the Poisson tensor with itself is zero. Um, and in the, in the quasi Poisson case, which is defined by um, the property that the Schalten bracket of beta with itself is not zero, um, which is um, connected to um, the, the failure of, of the Jacobiator of, of three functions. Um, so let, let's compare this quasi Poisson case with the three product um, upstairs. Um, and by comparing this, we see that there's a, a very similar part. So this looks really like. Um, that conformal field theory knows something about deformation quantization of quasi Poisson structures. Um, and so let's again take up this relation. So, in the theory of Lie algebraids, um, this is well known. So, um, taking the Poisson, taking the Schalten bracket with beta is equivalent to a, a differential um, on the tangent space. So, there is some relation to um, quasi Lie algebraids. So what, what can we learn if we, if we study the um, theory of quasi Lie algebraids um, of, the of the geometry um, of R fluxes and the other geometric fluxes? So let's take this. Um, what I mean by the other fluxes, I mean um, if we take one t-duality um, to, the, to the H flux, we get what is called a geometric flux. Um, if we take another t-duality, we get what, what is called a Q flux. And there's again a t-duality which is up to now conjectured. We get the R flux, so this I mean by um, um, the or, or, so to say, the, the uh, set of fluxes. So what can we learn if we consider um, quasi Lie algebraids? Um, there are two standard quasi Lie algebraids. Thanks. Um, the tangent bundle, which is trivial, and the cotangent bundle. And if we combine them, there's a mathematical theorem that says that we can associate to it a Kuro algebraid structure with a corresponding Kuro bracket. 
Um, and, and if we combine them and evaluate the Coulomb bracket, we, we, are, we are able to derive um, algebra, which is well known from, from um, gauge supergravities. Um, and in addition, if we project it again to the tangent bundle, which is um, possible because we have an anchor map, um, we, we can derive um, the anti identities for, for general fluxes um, by considering the Jacobi atlas. Um, and future aspects of our work would be to do really a differential geometry on, on Lie algebra, especially um, the case of T star M, um, where we could define a covariant derivative, for example, in, in, a, in a form direction, so in the direction of a, of a one form, for example. Um, yeah, so I think that's all, and it's time for a gong. Excellent. Uh, all moving along on time, so we have time for one question. Yeah. So the question is, what was beta? So beta is a Poisson tensor, and um, sorry. Um, so you can, if you take the, the beta differential of beta, you get, for example, the R flux. So this this is how it's connected to to a non-geometric flux. But there is so, a direct interpretation of beta itself. Um, beta itself. So as I said, the, the interpretation in Poisson geometry is the Poisson tensor, which defines a, an, an anchor map, but um, directly um, in, 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 so it's, it's, I would say it's the potential for the R flux. Okay, very good. I think we have to cut off. Thank you very much, Andre. <laughs> and next we have Min Xin Huang, who will tell us about the refined topological string. Take it away, Min Xin. Uh, thanks very much. So today I will talk about refined topological strings. Um, this is mostly based on these two works, um, one by myself and the other with Amr uh, Kashini, Kashani Pur and Albrecht Krem. Um, so let me start with uh, four-dimensional n equals two supersymmetric gauge theory. It's well known that uh, effective actions is determined by a holomorphic quantity known as the prepotentials. Um, in a seminar work in 1994, uh, Cyber and Rhythm uh, solved the prepotential using the holomorphicity and monodromy um, around singular point of the moduli space. So the main parts of the low energy effective actions uh, comes from instanton contributions. Um, later, Nakasov uh, found the uh, Nakasov partition functions that provides formula for direct computations of instanton contributions. So this uh, computation looks very different from cyber rhythm method, but it can be proven um, by mathematically that they give the same um, prepotentials. Um, so, but actually, Nakasov. Uh, partition function contains more information. It has the so-called gravitational coupling, uh, which is um, basically the coefficients of R squared times gravity photon uh, field strings. Um, you can see in this uh, expansion of the Kasov partition function that this higher order, the leading terms is the prepotential, and the higher order terms are these gravitational couplings. And uh, we know that Nakasov partition functions are related to a topological string on Calabrian freefall by geometric engineering. In topological string, we know there's a perturbative uh, expansion in the genus of the Virgis. Now here we see uh, there are two uh, expansion parameters of the omega background. So motivated by this uh, gauge theory calculations, uh, one's trying to uh, refine the topological string to include uh, two-parameter expansions, this uh, so-called refined topological string theory. So basically, this uh, refined topological string theory can be um, defined as generating functions of this uh, refined PPS invariant, which is uh, generalization of the well-known uh, Gopakuma wafa invariants that counts of Five D uh, BPS particles. So I know of two ways to compute top, uh, the topological string. One is this A model method by refined topological vertex. 
Another is use the mirror is to use the B model method of uh, uh, generalized holomorphic anomaly equations. So our result is to use the um, generalized holomorphic anomaly equations and also the some boundary conditions at the singular point of the moduli space to compute this gravitational coupling that we provide formula that sum up all instanton contributions to the uh, at the given genus and you also generalize to the case with matters. So, these are the this formula. So, so how to prove our formulas? So, um, at leading order it is proven by uh, Nakasov et al. So, uh, I found uh, that uh, simplification occur at this so called Nakasov Satoshvili limit where you set one of the epsilon parameter to 0. In uh, this limit as you can use some set of point method to derive differential equations for the um, f n 0. So, um, we can prove our formula satisfy these equations and furthermore that in um, I can also show that this uh, formula satisfy the uh, holomorphic anomaly equations. Um, and it would be interesting to also show that they satisfy the so called gap conditions. Um, um, ok, so these are the H theory case and one can also uh, apply the similar method to topological string. In this case uh, you can compute the so called refined uh, uh, BPS invariants or Kuma Wafa invariants. So, we in a work in progress is that we compute try to compute the refined BPS invariant for some non toric Calabian manifold in this case that the A model is not Thanks, Thanks again Minchin. So, next we have Arthur Lipstein from Saclay who will tell us about scattering amplitudes in three dimensions. Go for it, Arthur. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing me to speak today. Um, today, I'm going to talk about some work in progress with Lionel Mason uh, regarding three uh, scattering amplitudes in uh, three dimensional gauge theories. Um, and basically, in three dimensions, you have two types of gauge theories you have um, 3D Yang Mills theories and you have 3D Chern Simons theories. And whereas there's been a lot of uh, recent progress in computing amplitudes for 3D Chern Simons theories, the amplitudes for 3D Yang Mills theories have been uh, explored to a lesser extent. And so, today I would like to describe um, some recent results uh, regarding the amplitudes of maximal 3D Yang Mills theories. Um, so, in computing amplitudes in three dimensions, it is useful to use uh, to parameterize the amplitudes um, in terms of variables known as twisters. And uh, for conformal theories like uh, uh, Chern Simons theories, it is convenient uh, to use a four component object um, uh, known as a twister. But, but for non conformal theories like 3D Yang Mills theories, it is convenient to use a three component object. Uh, known as a mini twister and in particular if you write the action of maximal uh, 3D super Yang Mills um, in mini twister space uh, you, you find that it is possible to compute ampl uh, amplitudes using what is called an MHV formalism or in other words you can compute non MHV amplitudes by pasting together MHV amplitudes uh, via propagators and it is a little bit subtle um, as uh, to how one defines helicity in three dimensions because a 3D gluon only has one polarization but nevertheless it is possible and furthermore the 3D MHV rules uh, look quite different than the ones in 4D. In any case, uh, using the fact that 3D, a maximal 3D Yang Mills uh, has a helicity structure, one can uh, perform an inductive proof uh, that they also have dual conformal, uh, dual conformal covariance. And basically, what that means is, for example, if you if you consider a four-point amplitude and you take the four external momenta and you arrange them into a polygon, and then you express the amplitude in, as as a function of the vertices of the polygon, uh, then the amplitude transforms covariantly. Uh, under inversions of, of the dual space coordinates and, and this has two important implications. First of all it implies that the amplitudes can be computed using a uh, Grassmannian integral formula in a three dimensional momentum twister space and also uh, it, it provides I think new information from the point of view of scattering amplitudes uh, that the maximal 3D Yang Mills theory is related to the ABGM theory because they happen uh, to be the only theories I think in three dimensions that have uh, dual conformal properties. Uh, also, um, the loop loop um, amplitudes uh, have an intriguing structure as well. 
in um, particular using dimensional regularization, what one finds is the one loop MHV amplitudes of maximal 3D angles are zero, and the one loop non MHV amplitudes are finite. And this is actually some, somehow compatible with the one loop corrections that were found in the ABGM theory, which is a 3D uh, superconformal Chern Simons theory. And what this suggests is that it might even be possible to relate the two theories order by order in perturbation theory. Uh, so I'd just like to end uh, on, on two basic points. Uh, first of all, uh, what I'd like to say is that uh, 3D, the amplitudes of 3D Yang-Mills theory uh, have m many interesting properties uh, which don't follow trivially uh, from dimensional reduction of four-dimensional Yang-Mills theory. And, and second of all, uh, I think that they'll provide some in, uh, deep new insights uh, into um, 3D Chern-Simons theories. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Arthur. We have time for a question. Questions? Yes. Ah, well, questions, how do you define helicity? How do you define helicity in three dimensions? Um, well, basically the idea is that in three, uh, in three dimensions you can take a, a, a gluon can be dualized to a scalar, and then, the, then if, if you have another scalar uh, sitting around, uh, helicity is sort of defined as, as a, U1, a U1 symmetry that rotates the two scalars. That, that's one way to define it. Another more physically intuitive way to define it is basically by dimensional reduction from uh, 4D helicity. You, you could basically think, you could basically think of it as having a 4D theory and sort of restricting all the kinematics to lie in a three-dimensional three -dimensional plane. Um. Very good. Let's thank Arthur again. And up next, we have Andrea Poom, who will tell us about metastable fuzzballs. Thank you. Um, so this is uh, based on work with my supervisor, Josef Bena, and uh, Bert Benjocke, who's a postdoc in Zagleb. Our motivation is to look for the microscopic degrees of freedom of black holes, and in particular, non-extreme black holes, in the regime where the effective string coupling is large. And uh, for the analysis that I want to flash, I will assume the strong variant of the fuzzball proposal, which says that uh, a fair amount of black hole microstates can actually be described in supergravity. And then let's see what uh, the physics of these geometries can teach us. For extremal black holes, a large number of these geometries has been constructed, and they give strong evidence that the singularity of the black hole is resolved at the scale of the black hole horizon. So the black hole should be viewed as an averaging over um, these uh, horizonless geometries, which smoothly cap off at some finer distance in the throat, and there is no more space time behind the location of the would be horizon. So far, so good. But the important question is what happens for non extremal black hole? And in this case, the first proposal says that the singularity should be resolved at the scale of the outer horizon in the past of the singularity. And to test this proposal, we should better construct a representative amount of these non extremal microstates. And that's what I will talk about in the following. As an upshot, I give the main result. We find metastable fastball configuration that have the size of the order of the black hole out horizon. And this gives us good confidence that the fastball proposal indeed extends to near extremal black holes. Our construction is inspired by the probe analysis of Kachu, Pesten, and Felinde. So we start with a supersymmetric background geometry and place certain probes of particular charge such that they break supersymmetry and they give rise to metastable configurations. Our probes are super tubes. Those are tubular brain configuration that have lower dimensional brain charge dissolved in flux and are stabilized against collapse by angular momentum. Supertubes placed in flat space have a Hamiltonian of this type and it stabilizes at the supersymmetric value of the radius which is determined by the tube charges. Now we want to place the supertubes in the background of supersymmetric black hole microstates of the Bena Warner type. These are bubbling geometries that have topologically non-trivial cycles started by flux. And we want to place these tubes in the deep throat region of these geometries in such a way that they wrap part of the complication torus and the, the fiber of the base space. The Hamiltonian of these supertubes in these bubbling geometries looks like this. It differs from the flat space Hamiltonian due to the interaction of the tube charges with the flux of the background. And for some values of these tube charges, this potential turns out to have metastable minima. And here's a typical plot. So if you localize uh, supertubes in a supersymmetric minima, the energy is just given by the sum of the tube charges, which is normalized to zero in this plot. And if I were to back correct supertubes in these locations, they would just give rise to another supersymmetric microstate geometry um, corresponding to an extremal black hole whose mass is given by the sum of the tube and the background charges. Metastable minima, on the other hand, have an excess energy or mass above extremality, and so they correspond to microstates of non-extremal black holes. 
Now there's interesting tube dynamics. The metastable tubes can tunnel to the supersymmetric minimum via brain flux inhalation. So the negative tube charge annihilates against uh, the positive charge of the, the flux uh, and thus in this process reducing the total amount of flux in the geometry. This process corresponds to the emission of the last talking quantum from the near extremal fastball before it becomes extremal. Um, in order to address the question of the singularity resolution scale, we have to compute the size of this fastball. And um, the result is that for a certain range of tube charges, we obtain fastballs that are of equal size of the black hole. Those should be viewed as the typical black hole microstates. And as expected, we also obtain atypical microstates, which are a bit deeper or shallower than the black hole. And to wrap up, the analysis that I presented you involving metastable supertubes in bubbling geometries with a charge that uh, is opposite with respect to the background provides a systematic way to construct a huge class of uh, near extremal black hole microstates which have a certain, which have interesting properties and there is yet more to be explored. Thank you. Great, thank you Andrea. We have time for one question. Raphael? My, my. Um, okay, so for the extremal case, there is a, an amount of uh, microstates that have been constructed, but they're not enough to account for the entropy of the black hole. For non-extremal uh, fastballs, well, for non-extremal black holes, there's only two classes of solutions that have been constructed so far. So it's important to push this further and get uh, a more representative amount of microstates and to study what one can learn from these geometries to say something about the applicability of the fastball proposal for non-extremal black holes. Excellent. Let's thank Andrea again. Now we have Hello from Stanford, Princeton, who will talk about the wave function of the universe in higher spin gravity. Take it away, Dan. All right, hey, th uh, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here having fun in Munich. Um, so how do I advance slides? Let's try that, okay. So, okay, DSCFT relates the hurdle hawking wave function and the partition function of some CFT. Uh, so here's some formula basically saying that, okay, here's some, say, bulk scalar field. It's the source for some operator in the CFT. Here's the bulk metric. Uh, it's the metric the CFT lives on. But you have to take the limit of large geometry so that you can get up to the de Sitter boundary. So that's epsilon going to zero. Um, typically, the local divergences are phase. So the square of the hurdle hawking wave function has a smooth limit as epsilon goes to zero. And that's what I'm going to compute today in the boundary field theory. Which boundary field theory? This one that Andy talked about. Um, it's the SPN model of Grassmann scalars. It's a non-unitary theory with SPN symmetry, so omega is some n by n symplectic matrix. Uh, you see here I have a conformal mass for this chi. It lives on the, uh, on the metric G, and then sigma is a source for some scalar operator. Um, so of course, the scalar operator is dual to a massive bulk scalar. Uh, and T mu nu, the stress tensor, is dual to the bulk metric. Um, so these sigma and g, you can think of them as finite deformations of the CFT by those operators. Um, there are also a set of higher spin uh, single trace um, SPN singlet operators that look like that. They're symmetric, traceless, and conserved. And they're dual to massless higher spin bulk fields uh, explained by Vasiliev. Um, today, I'll only turn on sources for S equals 0 and S equals 2. OK, so just uh, one, two more technical comments before I show you the results. Um, so since the dimension of J0 is 1, which is less than 3 halves, uh, the alternate quantization is what we're talking about here, which means that the interpretation of sigma in the bulk is not as the boundary value of the field phi. It's rather the boundary value of some linear or combination of phi and its canonical momenta. Um, so in Pfefferman grand gauge, maybe you know. So then epsilon is like t, and the canonical momenta is just like that. Um, so in DSCFT, unlike ADSCFT, you see there's only one quantization. The alternate quantization is just looking at the same wave function in a different basis, in the basis of this Hermitian operator instead of the phi operator. OK. Finally, to impose the singlet constraint, we in general need to gauge the SPN symmetry. So we do that by coupling the churn simons and taking the limit k goes to infinity, but we don't have to worry about it on S3. OK, results. A constant mass deformation on S3 of this theory. We want to compute that functional determinant. Um, here's what it looks like. OK. It's locally peaked at the DS invariant point sigma, and it has zeros coming from the fermion zero modes in that determinant where you expect them. But the good stuff is that it grows exponentially at large negative sigma, which we interpret as suggesting a non-perturbative instability of the sitter space. 
Uh, remember that sigma order one means phi of order root n, if you remember the dictionary that I showed a minute ago here. Um, so it's a non-perturbative instability. I'll comment more on it in a minute. Uh, you can also compute it on a squashed sphere, sphere as a function of the squashing. There it's normalizable and it's peaked at the round sphere. Um, finally, you can compute it on S2 times S1 um, as, a, as, a, as a function of the relative size of S2 and S1, which is beta or the temperature if you like. Um, this is the formula. I'm not going to get into it in too much detail now, but at large temperature, meaning T much greater than root n, uh, this is something discovered by Schenker and Yin. Uh, the eigenvalue potential pushes all the eigenvalues to pi. That's a gross Witten kind of phase transition. And you see that it blows up at large t, which is small s1. Uh, okay, so some final comments. Um, the divergence at small s1 also happens in Einstein gravity. Uh, if you do, if you include certain complex solutions in a DS version of the usual Hawking page analysis. Um, the divergence at, at uh, negative sigma actually brings about a non-perturbative inconsistency in the critical uh, interacting SPN model. So non-perturbatively in, in N, it seems like there's no path integral that gives you the perturbation series you would naively expect. This does not happen in the ON model. It better not. Um, okay, we do, we show both in the paper. All right, finally, um, so, th you know, our interpretation of this scalar divergence is just that the probability distribution at late times is not concentrated around asymptotically de Sitter configurations. So in other words, de Sitter is unstable. Uh, there's a star I'll comment on at the end if I have time. This is consistent with general arguments about the sitter space. Um, if it's unstable, where does it go? Well, these people have said um, that uh, Vasiliev's theories in, in the ADS case can be understood as limits of string theories. So perhaps these decays dynamically connect Vasiliev's theory into sitter space to the rest of the string landscape. Okay, so now quickly about the star. Well, I only turned on two of the sources. To really determine the wave function is non-normalizable, I have to integrate over all the higher spin fields, the sources for all the higher spin fields, and I didn't do that. Um, uh, that's a technical challenge that remains, but at least some preliminary computations suggest that's not going to help and that this really is an instability. Okay, thanks a lot for listening. Great, thanks, Dan. I'm afraid we have to keep moving. So next we have Alessandra Niecki from Padua, who will tell us about duality and variance for black holes in N equals 2 gauge supergravity. Take it away, Thank Alessandra. So. But thanks, first of all, the organizers for this gong show. I'm going to present some work on black holes in gauge supergravity that I've done in collaboration with Jan Guido de Lagata. We considered uh, theories of n equal to 2 supergravity with U1 gauging because in there, uh, a scalar potential appears that mimics a cosmological constant and thus allows the study of black hole solutions in asymptotically curved geometries like ADS4. These solutions uh, might have uh, scalars uh, that uh, have a non-trivial profile. Thus, it might be interesting to ask what the corresponding holographic configurations are. These black holes are also stable, so they might play a role in the destabilization of aqua in the context of string landscape. Solutions are actually known since the late 90s by the work of different groups. Uh, however, in the extremal limit, uh, the BPS solutions did not al admit a finite horizon radius. And we have to wait until 2009 for Katatori and Clem to show that it is actually possible to have a BPS black hole in anti deceptor with the spherical horizon and finite area, which means finite entropy. So we proposed to systematically study these solutions to derive the supersymmetric flow from a fully uh, symplectic covariant framework. Let me add here that uh, uh, related the work on the same solution has been uh, carried out in the last year and a half also by the group in Utrecht. So we consider geometries that are captured by these metric concepts and interpolate between uh, these the infinite uh, region, uh, asymptotic infinity region, and these near horizon. So in addition to the attractor condition provided by the infinite rows of ADS2 times S2, we have to add an additional supersymmetric condition at infinity. We are in the presence of a sort of double attractor condition that further constrains the scalars and reduces the number of solutions we can actually find. An important role in the derivation of the VPS flow is played by this quantity. It is constructed as the central charge, but instead of using black hole charges, we now use the gauging charges. This L provides a shift in the central charge that gives the superpotential. In absence of gauging, this just reduces to the well-known superpotential for ungaged supergravity. What has no analog in the ungaged limit is this charge quantization condition. 
that is equivalent to what Romans found for its supersymmetric monopole solution. Moreover, the equivalence goes on. In fact, also here we have to impose a double projection condition on the killing spinners to find the equations of motion, and so we end up with a one-quarter BPS solution. Once we have the superpotential, we can study its critical points and find the attractor equations. This one reduces to the attractor equation in engaged supergravity once we turn off the gauging. The second one is new and uh, contains information about the, the area and thus gives the entropy. If we project this equation on the scalar section, we find two interesting uh, expressions for the area and thus the entropy. These two quantities, in fact, are built out of the second symplectic invariant and suggest that also in the gauged case, the, air, the entropy of the black hole might have an interesting geometric interpretation. However, only one class of solution in the STU model has been explicitly constructed, so extensions are needed. And uh, in the direction of uh, multicenter black holes, it would be re relevant to have a, a general derivation of the base space for the metric concepts. But let me leave you with a remark on the rotating solutions. If we try to write in a covariant, uh, symplectic covariant way, the first order equation for the angular velocity one form, we are led to the introduction of a one form of uh, the gauging that uh, is related to the gauge parameters. Actually, it turns out this one form is related to the three holomorphic momentum map. So it seems that there's an SU2 structure that mixes with the SO3 symmetry of the space-time, and uh, I believe this uh, mixing might be clarified once we'll have um, microscopic or stringy derivation of these black hole solutions. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandra. So we have time for one question. Questions from the audience? Going once, going twice. Okay, let's thank Alessandra again. <laughs> and next up is Pyotr Slokowski from Amsterdam, who will tell us about the super A polynomial. Go for it, Pyotr. Okay, so the title of my talk is Quantum Super A Polynomial, and this is based on the recent work of Hiroyuki Fuji and Sergei Gukov. And to start with, let me recall that in some uh, exactly solvable theories, certain quantities can be encoded in algebraic curves or Riemann surfaces, like Sarbay Covitan curve or mirror curves or A polynomials. And these quantities include, for example, dependence on various moduli or omega or beta deformation or quantum deformation. And I'd like to introduce an object which captures all this information at once, and I call it quantum super A polynomial, or simply super A polynomial in case when quantum deformation is turned off. And to be specific, I will introduce that in the context of knot theory, where this object will generalize ordinary A polynomial by introducing two deformations. The first one denoted by A related to considering SU and gauge group of term Simon's theory, and then the parameter T related to categorification. And these two deformations could be considered independently. However, they can also be encoded in one object, as I will just show in a minute. But first, let me recall that various polynomials are not invariants, such as Jones polynomial or Humphrey, arise as Wilson loops in turn Simon's theory. And one interesting class of these polynomial invariants is called colored polynomials. They are labeled by symmetric representations or Young diagrams consisting of one row of n boxes. And here is one example of such. Uh, this is Jones polynomial in just in the fundamental representation. And then this can be generalized by introducing uh, dependence on A by considering SU and gauge group, and then by considering homological not invariants and introducing parameter T as the uh, parameter which enters one pair polynomial of certain triply graded homology theory. And such an object is called super polynomial. Here is the example of the super polynomial also for the trefoil knot in the fundamental representation. And then uh, it is also interesting to consider asymptotics, let's say of Jones polynomial, when n goes to infinity, it turns out that this is encoded in a certain algebraic curve called A polynomial. Here is an example of this A polynomial for trefoil knot. And this curve can also be quantized, and then this provides certain recursion relations for Jones polynomial for all n, not only for n going to infinity. 
And this quantum polynomial is expressed in terms of uh, x hat and y hat operators which satisfy this commutation relation. And when h bar goes to 0, then this quantum polynomial reduces to ordinary 1. And then the question arises if all these properties of polynomial and also related volume conjectures, if that can be extended to the realm of homological not invariance. And the answer is yes. And this is what we present in these two papers. Namely, we claim that all versions of, of volume conjectures can be generalized to A and P dependent versions. And then this color dependence of super polynomials is governed by super A polynomial or quantum super A polynomial. And uh, apart from uh, this result, this is also interesting to consider certain specializations of super A polynomial, either refined A polynomial, which captures just T dependence or q deformed polynomial which was recently introduced by Mina Aganagic and uh, Kumrun Bafa and also independently by Lenny Inc. So as I don't have that much time let me just give examples of the super A polynomial. This is the result which we find for the trefoil knot. This is a quantum operator of the second order in Y. It has some complicated coefficients which are which depend on x hat and then A and T parameters. And knowledge of this operator allows us to find explicit answer for super polynomial, in this case for this refoil for all n, this is the answer. And then the analysis of this result or the classical limit of this result gives us uh, the super A polynomial which takes this form and then for A equal 1 or and T equal minus 1 we reproduce this known result ordinary A polynomial. So we see that there is much more structure behind this result. And also another example for the figure 8 knot given here, we also find super A polynomial, classical one is given here, quantum one is more complicated of the third order in Y. And even though this might seem a bit random, this is not, this has very intricate structure, just to give a brief example of that, here is Newton polygon of this uh, object. So to summarize, I introduced super A polynomial, it generalizes many properties of ordinary A polynomial, it also arises in other uh, physical situations on one hand in topological strings and on the other hand this super A polynomial I just described describes supersymmetric vacuum of dual three dimensional and equal to theories associated to the knot complement and of course there is much more work to be done one is uh, tempted to find a super super A polynomials for other knots. Sorry about that, but the train must move on. So uh, next and last, we have uh, Ehsan Hatifi from ICTP Trieste, who will tell us about all order alpha prime corrections to BPS and non-BPS brain world volume theories. Go for it, Ehsan. Okay, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for organizing such a nice uh, uh, conference and uh, apologize to the audience. I cannot point out because I just lost my glasses. So uh, the title of my talk is about uh, universality in all order alpha prime correction uh, to BPS non-BPS brain board volume theories which is based on the following papers. So uh, let's uh, start by motivation. Uh, the first motivation is in fact discovering universality for all orders of alpha prime correction to BPS non-BPS brain board volume theories. Uh, the second motivation it's uh, is in fact, it seems that uh, the description of word volume dynamics of brain is uh, still lacking at some fundamental level in the sense that uh, as a comment, uh, we couldn't produce all, all contact terms which are appeared in super string theory by usual pullback. So uh, I think it seems that uh, perhaps uh, pullback may need modification. And uh, the third motiv motivation is in fact, if, if we were able to produce the string theory correction to the field theory perturbatively in alpha prime by means of scattering amplitude arguments. Another uh, more ambitious direction would be to make progress uh, in the complete form of non-abelian uh, DBI and tachyonic effective action. And also finding a, a closed form of higher derivative correction. The, the other thing is that uh, given that a close, a close relation between an open string and closed string must be behind the DSCFT, the amplitude involving a mixture of open string and closed string uh, should be especially worth studying. And also finding this, you know, uh, discovering new Meyer stream. I believe that the result of these works uh, will provide the basis for future research. For example, next to the leading order uh, dielectric effect and also related topic in string theory. Uh, so, 
please pay attention. The derivative of gauge, gauge field stress and uh, the derivative of scalars are not included in DPI action. Having set uh, its matrix method, uh, we, were embed, uh, we were able to embed uh, them in DBI of effective action. Let's uh, start by giving an example. Suppose we want to produce the amplitude of one kilo string Ramon Ramon in the bulk and three scalar fields in type two super string theory. This amplitude has many terms, but for the purpose of this talk, uh, actually I'm going to talk about the, the, the third part of the amplitude, which has infinite masses fall in T, in T plus S plus U channel. So as is uh, already well known, uh, the expansion is low energy expansion, which means that by sending alpha prime goes to zero, we, we actually end up with all infinite mass poles, which are in, in T plus S plus U channel. So uh, the first simple massless scalar pole is going to, to be reproduced by non-abelian kinetic term of scalar field, which are, which are coming from DBI effective action. And in order to produce all massless scalar poles, uh, one has to find the higher derivative correction to born in action to all orders of alpha prime. So here is the higher derivative correction of born, higher derivative correction of four scalar fields up to all orders of alpha prime. So uh, where the definition of where D and M, D prime and M must be defined as the following. Now I'm going to talk about universality. So uh, several amplitudes suggest that there exists a regularity in the higher derivative expansion. One can formulate a prescription based on them. So here is a prescription. In order to find all infinite higher derivative correction, first of all, we must find this matrix of uh, desired amplitude, which are either BPS or non-BPS planes. And the second step is, in fact, uh, applying the relation between understand variables. Uh, in fact, uh, we must rewrite the amplitude such that all poles can be seen in a clear way. And the third step is uh, finding leading couplings from tachonic DBI, tachonic DBI or DBI effective action. And finally, expressing symmetric, symmetric stress prescription in terms of ordinary trace and applying D and M and D prime and M where I defined uh, the, their definition. The second example is, in fact, for higher derivative correction of four, four field students, which are defined as the following. And these couplings have already been checked by explicit computation in the amplitude of one Raman Raman and three, as three gauge fields in the word volume of BPS parent. So it's, uh, you may think of uh, some sort of T-duality transformation, but uh, the, the form of vertex operator of uh, tachyon is completely different from uh, the form of vertex operator of scalar fields and gauge fields. It's really interesting that uh, this kind of higher derivative correction does work for, uh, also for uh, non-BPS case and in particular for tachyons. So as the last example, uh, let's find the higher derivative correction of, higher derivative correction to two tachyons and two scalar fields. First we find uh, the prescription for the leading order and which are this, which are defined as the following. And the, the higher derivative correction could be, could be found by applying the prescriptions. So, uh, so this phenomenon seems quite universal and must have deep origin going back to the relation of an open string and closed string. It should originate from the composite nature of a closed string state in terms of open string states. Uh, Thank you very much, Asan. So, uh, 